This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. To begin today's show is Allison Womack, Agricultural Program Specialist with the Kansas Farm Service Agency, with reminders about acreage reporting, dairy margin coverage, CRP, and marketing assistance loans. We are also joined by Ron Wilson for a Kansas Profile. Community Health Extension Specialist Elaine Johannes continues the show by sharing knowledge about mental health for listeners, as May is Mental Health Month. The Beef Cattle Institute's Brad White, Bob Larson, Brian Lubers, Philip Lancaster, and Dustin Pendle finish today's show by talking about census numbers for llamas, alpacas, and honeybees. That and more is coming up ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Wednesday show with some information from the Kansas Farm Service Agency. And this week, we're joined by Agricultural Program Specialist with the Kansas Farm Service Agency, Allison Womack. Allison, thanks for joining us today. Happy to be here. Allison, starting off our conversation with stuff from the Kansas Farm Service Agency, talking about acreage reporting. Right. You know, with planting season just starting, uh, I just want to hit home the importance of reporting your acres to both us and your crop agents. Um, The earlier you do it, the better. When you cross-reference between both of us, we can compare our acres, find some errors, let us know what you're doing with your crops. Um, It's important to let us know, especially with your grass. Are you grazing it? Are you going to hay it this year? You know, if you you change year to year, you need to let us know. If we hit a drought situation, it It'll save you some extra fees in the long run if you let us know up front. Are you changing shares? Do you have a new owner? Let us know all that information. And so when it comes to acreage reporting, what do they need to report? Anything they have an interest in, hay fields, pastures, crops, any CRP also needs to be reported by July 15th. So if something has changed from last year to this year, just let the Farm Service Agency know? Yep, let us know. Something that has come to a close and wanting to throw out a few numbers, the dairy margin coverage. Yeah, we had a good turnout this year. We had a total of 126 contracts. Um, We're hoping to continue promoting dairies in Kansas. And as we're thinking about Kansas dairy, also just wanting to make a mention that the Farm Service Agency is kind of keeping an eye on the highly pathogenic avian influenza. Right. Um, We know Kansas is one of the affected states. Uh, At this point, we don't have any programs for it. Um, It's ineligible for DIP. Dairy Indemnity Payment Program. FDA is continuing to watch it and we'll keep an eye on it. Also wanting to mention the Conservation Reserve Program and what's happening right now when it comes to that. Sure. Um, We are anticipating a grassland CRP sign up. Uh, At this point, we do not know of a starting date, but that's hopefully coming. Uh, That's a great program. You can utilize hay and graze acres, all contingent upon your conservation plan made with NRCS. Um, That particular program does not require cropping history, so it's very appealing to some producers. We've just entered the primary nesting season, April 15th through July 15th. So during that time, obviously no ground disturbance, no cover disturbance on your CRP. Uh, We want to continue to encourage producers to maintain their CRP, you know, keep your noxious weeds under control, keep out that woody encroachment, obviously no mowing, um, and follow your conservation plan. If people can't remember what their conservation plan is, is there a way for them to find it? Uh, Yeah, reach out to your local FSA office for sure. And when it comes to CRP, if they're doing something on it, do they need to reach out to their FSA office? I would highly advise it. CRP is kind of a broad program, so what you can do with your contract, your neighbor may not be able to. So I would always encourage you before doing something, ask the questions, reach out to your local FSA and NRCS. And wanting to make a mention if someone's thinking about selling their CRP? Please let us know. The sooner you let us know, the sooner we can work on those revisions and the less headache it causes in the long run. And also wanting to mention while you're in today, Allison, the marketing assistant loans. Yeah, uh, marketing assistance loans are great short-term loans. Uh, You get a better interest rate typically than your local bank. It's a great way to provide cash flow to producers. The final availability date for feed grains, you know, such as corn, barley, oats, wheat, and soybeans is going to be this upcoming May 31st. And as we always do when the Farm Service Agency is in, if people would like to find out more information about these programs or other programs, how can they do that? 
contact your local farm service agency. Um, you can find more information from us at farmers.gov. Allison, if someone would like to spend time with you at the Farm Service Agency, is there a way they can do that? Yes, we are hiring right now at the Farm Service Agency. So if you want to set up a profile, you'll go to usajobs.gov. You set up a profile and you can get alerts catered to you. You know, you want to be within 25 miles. There's all kind of parameters that you can put in and you'll get an email alert anytime something opens up. Allison, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Yeah, thank you so much. That was Agricultural Program Specialist with the Kansas Farm Service Agency, Allison Womack. If you'd like to find more information from the Kansas Farm Service Agency, you can do so by going to your local service center. If you don't know which one is your local service center, you can find it by going to their website, farmers.gov, and going in the upper right-hand corner and clicking on Service Centers. I, of course, will link that in today's show notes on agtoday.net. Before we cut to a break, we're now going to be joined by Ron Wilson, the director of the Huck Boyd National Institute for Rural Development at Kansas State University, as he shares this week's Kansas profile. This week is Karen Meggie and her husband, Darren. After being disappointed in store-bought ice cream during the pandemic, they decided to see if they could make better ice cream. And that was the start of Flint Hill Pines. Hear more from Ron. This is Kansas Profile. I'm Ron Wilson, director of the Huck Boyd National Institute for Rural Development at Kansas State University. Whoever created this flavor of ice cream hit a home run. That's what someone might say after tasting another new ice cream flavor created by this ruralpreneur who has launched a delicious new business from rural Kansas. It's today's Kansas Profile. Karen and Darren Meggie are the founders and owners of Flint Hills Pints in Elma. Darren grew up on the family farm near Alma, where the Meggies and his 90-year-old father live today. Darren met and married Karen, who'd moved to Kansas from Indiana. They are the fourth generation to live in the farmhouse built by his great-grandfather. During the pandemic, the Meggies bought ice cream at the store, but were disappointed at the quality. I could make my own ice cream better than this, Karen told Darren. She gathered recipes and started experimenting in her kitchen. Meggie gave away samples, and the response was very positive. One friend of ours is an animal science professor at K-State, and he said it was really good, she said. Another friend works at a large grocery chain. When you get that ready for wholesale, let us know, he said. The Maggies decided to launch their own ice cream business. They acquired the necessary licenses, set up a production facility in nearby Elma, and purchased a mobile trailer. I wanted to call it Maggie Moose, but that was too close to an existing business name, Maggie said. Since the Maggies were selling ice cream by the pint from their Flint Hills location, they decided to call it Flint Hills Pints. Flint Hills Pints produces ice cream using milk acquired locally from Hildebrand Dairy. They use their own eggs and all they can acquire from neighbors. Maggie cooks her own base for the ice cream and then adds fruit and spices as needed. There's no artificial colorings or flavorings, Maggie said. We don't use any food colorings or dyes in our products, she said. The K-State Value Added Foods Lab helped with development of nutritional labeling. The Maggies also joined the From the Land of Kansas program, operated by the Kansas Department of Agriculture. I can't say enough good things about them, Maggie said. It's been great working with them. The business has grown to include a second trailer. The trailers go to farmers' markets and special events. It is also possible to order online for pickup. Flint Hills Pints offers classic flavors such as vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, chocolate chip, cookies and cream, and butter brickle. And then there's ice cream flavored with Andy's Mint, Caramel Crunch with Heath, Espresso Chip, Cherry Nut, peach, Flint Rock Road, and many more. I like creating new flavors. The possibilities are endless, Maggie said. We can even create custom flavors, she said. She has created a loaded sweet potato flavor and one called cranberry tequila white chocolate chip. It retains the flavor, but we cook the alcohol out of it, Maggie said. One time, the Maggie's had company at their home, and Karen made German chocolate cake for dessert. When she found she had extras, she made that into ice cream. German chocolate cake is now one of their top-selling flavors. Another of her flavors combines blackberry, raspberry, strawberry, and blueberry. That one is called Home Run and is also a top seller. Flint Hills Pints offers ice cream pies and gluten-free crusts as an option. Customer comments include statements such as, Hands down, best ice cream I've ever had. And, the ice cream is fresh and the flavors are unique and delicious. And, it reminds us of how ice cream used to taste. It's good to find this enterprise in a rural community such as Alma, Population 802 people. Now that's rural. For more information, see 
www.flinthillspints.com. That's www.flinthillspints.com. Whoever created this flavor of ice cream had a home run. That's what someone might say after trying this all-natural combination of blackberry, raspberry, strawberry, and blueberry ice cream, which is indeed titled Home Run. We salute Karen and Darren Meggie for making a difference with all-natural, farmer-owned ice cream entrepreneurship. I think this business is covering all the bases. For the Huck Boyd National Institute for Rural Development, this is Ron Wilson with Kansas Profile. Once again, that was the director of the Huck Boyd National Institute for Rural Development at Kansas State University, Ron Wilson. And he was doing this week's Kansas Profile over Karen and Darren Meggie in their business, Flint Hills Pints, where they produce ice cream pints using local milk and eggs to produce all-natural ice cream and traditional and their own creative flavors. You can find out more information about this business by going to their website, flinthillspints.com. Again, that is flinthillspints.com. I will link it in today's show notes on actday.net. I will also put a link in today's show notes if you'd like to learn more about the Kansas profiles or check out ones from other weeks. You can also navigate to learn more by going to ksre.k-state.edu. Again, that is ksre.k-state.edu. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but stick around because when we come back, we'll be joined by Community Health Extension Specialist Elaine Johannes as she talks about mental health. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Wednesday show talking about mental health as May is Mental Health Month. And to talk about it, we're joined by Community Health Extension Specialist Elaine Johannes. Elaine, thanks for joining us today. Shelby, thank you. This is an important issue, and May is not the only time we should be thinking about mental health. We should all be taking care of our mental health and wellness every day of the year. And as we're thinking about mental health, what is mental health, Elaine? There's some definitions, um, but I think we could say it's our ability to meet the day, to function as human beings, and to feel like we have made a difference in our lives. There's mental health. If I were a physician, a mental health clinician, I would probably talk about behavioral health, our ability to, again, uh, function, to have a career to have relationship, but then also to not be substance use addicted, not to have certain emotional or feeling flares, but also have a cognitive ability to manage ourselves throughout the day. One of those terms we often hear when it comes to mental health, anxiety. There have been quite a few studies that have taken us into some thinking about anxiety as after the pandemic, did the pandemic, the global pandemic, create more anxiety about the world, about the economy, about our relationships, about our health and safety? But Shelby, when we look at some information surveys before the pandemic, even in 2018 and 2019, the United States anxiety rates were going up. We were becoming more anxious generally. And anxiety is almost like um, a dissatisfaction, feeling and believing that there is something not right. If our anxiety levels are increasing, then we look at depression levels too. They kind of go next step. Um, Anxiety could lead us to being depressed. Now, I'm not using that in a biochemical, physiological term, but the feeling of depression, um, those chronic blues, six weeks or more, that kind of is connected to this anxiety we're feeling as a society. And sometimes does that lead into isolation? Yes. If we feel like we're out of sorts, if we believe that things are not going well with us emotionally, that can result in social issues too. We isolate ourselves. We don't feel like we belong. We 
We don't have that feeling of happiness. And there is an element that maybe sometimes we feel shame. I'm embarrassed. I'm not happy today. I'm supposed to be joyful, but no, I'm not. Or I'm ashamed that everybody else seems to be doing well and and I'm not as productive as I could be. So that can create social isolation. Is that something where maybe a friend or coworker or someone around that person's life could pick up on cues there? Yeah. The cues are something that we need to be attentive to. Some of your listeners may be familiar with QPR, which is a program that Extension offers, uh, question, persuade, and respond. You question your friend in a very caring way and be ready for the response. Be authentically engaged and then persuade your friend if they do say, I'm not able to sleep at night, or my diet has changed, or my activities of daily living. Those changes over time really are something a friend, a colleague, a family member can cue into and then refer them, Q, P, and R. The referral out in our farm area, rural, and frontier area means that probably that friend needs to be a little bit more supportive than just refer to a healthcare professional because there are shortages. There aren't enough mental health professionals out in our rural frontier areas. You know, even though we have the 988 line, and it's a great number, and anyone can call it, actually you could text it too, and you can get some really good mental health help. That is also familiar with rural living. So it's not just for suicide prevention. 988 is for anyone having a mental health crisis or believe that they're nearing one. But that does not replace that caring family member or the caring friend or the friend at the co-op who's asking, hey, how are you doing? And actually be ready to listen. Elaine, before the interview, you mentioned three things that usually have to come together for people to unfortunately see suicide as an option. So there's been quite a bit of literature and research done on what's called the interpersonal theory of suicide. And we aren't talking about kids here. Shelby, we aren't talking about that child in grade school who does kill themselves or that high schooler. We're talking about adults and those three factors that some of the research has lent us to understand. The first factor is the feeling of burdensome. I am a burden. I am not as productive. So when we say our producers are producing, but what if they don't feel that they are as productive? They just feel I'm a burden. So that's factor one. Factor two is I am alone. And it could be the nature of, again, our agricultural industry. It is alone work, a lot of it. I am physically alone and I am social alone. I can't admit that the operation isn't producing like it was. I can't admit that I'm suffering from a chronic disease. I can't admit that I'm drug addicted with pain meds because, darn it, I am having back pain. The third thing, which is something we can all act on, is the person is capable They have the capacity to die by suicide. And that capacity can be they have a plan, they have the physical ability, and they have the means. And and I think back, Shelby, a couple of years ago, our Department of Ag in Kansas had gun locks. They would give them away. They would mail them to people. It was a national campaign to curtail, to stem the suicide rate of our producers, In this state especially, our suicide rate among agricultural-related industry professionals is quite high. So if we just deal with the capacity, the capability, by locking the gun up away from the ammunition, putting a gun lock on it, and that's what Department of Ag had, and they're quite effective. It's just a little loop and a lock on it, and it... Again, it, it helps the person calm down. It helps to engage that mental acuity and cognitive reasoning that sometimes is influenced and stymied by our emotions. So if we can slow the cascade down, slow down the thought, then hopefully we could stop some of the death by suicide. And firearms are not the only way people do commit suicide. So really just putting more steps in the way to making that even possible. 
Absolutely, absolutely. You know, when we think about injuries out on the operation, the tractor rollover, you know, the injury by going into the barn and something falling on top, many of those are injury-related, injury-related deaths. But sometimes you don't know the person intentionally decided to take that action until afterwards, until you would call it a post Vention, meaning friends start to talk about, you know, they notice the signs but never asked. And that's the reason why the QPR is really important. Ask. Ask the question to your friend, to the person you see at the co-op or the coffee shop. If you're worried, they may really be grateful and are likely grateful by an authentic question about how are you? And like I said, be ready for the response. And that response can be friendly encouragement, persuading them to see a professional or more more helpfully to refer them and to walk along with them when the person gets some of the help that they need. For people who are wanting to learn more about this for themselves and others, what are a few resources you recommend? Well, first and foremost, 988 is not just a suicide line. So I think people can call and actually get a good referral and get some good information about the closest mental health center or the telehealth that's available. And we find it to be really helpful when the producer is on the tractor and they check in with their therapist. And that is not unheard of. It's not to be ashamed for them. I did mention that Extension has some information. QPR is a program that Extension uh, agents and our professionals provide. So if you've got like a water district, a conservation meeting, if you've got some people who are convened, then contact any of your Extension agents and ask to have a QPR session. It only takes an hour, but it is a way to get people thinking, you know, become aware. And then probably the next thing is be a friend. Be willing to feel somewhat uncomfortable by asking and finding out how people are doing. I can't stop without also saying our physicians and our healthcare professionals who are in rural frontier are also looking at mental health issues. The New community mental health behavioral health center systems that are out in the state, they are in rural frontier. They can not only deal with mental health, but they can deal with physical health issues, substance use issues. So Kansas is actually creating some supports. We need to do a lot more, though, and then to be aware and of help. Elaine, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and talk about mental health with us. Thank you. Shelby, take care. That was Community Health Extension Specialist Elaine Johannes. I will link the resources that she mentioned in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead. You're tuned back into Agriculture Today, and we conclude our Wednesday show with part of the Beef Cattle Institute's Cattle Chat Podcast. This week, we're joined by Dustin Pendle, Bob Larson, Phil Plancaster, Brian Lubers, and Brad White as they talk about llamas and alpacas and honeybees. So over the last few months, we've talked about beef cattle. We've talked production, trade, consumer demand. Uh, this time, still going to go back to the U.S. Census, Livestock tab, but then I clicked on Specialty as opposed to Beef Cows, just more curiosity than anything. Pulled into vet school, parking lot back here. I saw some animals. I really wasn't sure what they were. Uh, I mean, I knew kind of what they were, but I wasn't 100% sure. So we're going to talk about llamas and alpacas. Oh, great yes. stuff we know a yeah. lot about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right in uh, our expertise. I guess my question was when I pulled out there, what is back in the um, alpaca or llamas? I, and I what's the difference? I, they, yeah, they've both alpacas. been back there at some point. I don't know what's back there now. If they have, if they have a little tuft between their ears, that's, the, that's probably an alpaca. Okay. Well, so we've, did, we've established our expert right, right. here. <laughs> so there's some differences, size, hair, and face. Alpaca's a little smaller, according to the Internet. Um, <laughs> I believe yeah. that. Yeah. Can you just tell me which – just give me the top state for llamas and alpacas. What produce inventory, production. Oh, oh, my gosh. I, I'm going to go California. I was going to go Northwest. I'll try Oregon. I'm going to go Ohio. Yeah, yeah. Pretty good. I, I mean, I would, Texas is for llamas, and Oregon is number two, number one and two. 
Uh, and then for alpacas, it's Colorado, Colorado, Ohio. Hmm. So, yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, a little different. Now, my other one is same census. It's inventory for honeybees. Uh, so, and we'll talk a little bit about how I think that relates to cattle. Yeah. So, uh, which states? Number one, top five. I would have only guessed two of these top five. North Dakota for honeybees. For honeybees. California, California and yeah. Texas, I think. Yeah, I, I was going to go maybe that Washington, Oregon Washington, area. Yeah. yeah. So, those are my ideas. North Dakota, which I never would have guessed. Uh, so just in be. full disclosure, my wife did the veterinary accreditation modules last weekend on <laughs> honeybees, and I had to listen to it while she was in the car. So, uh, <laughs> so Brian I was mean, cheating. I mean, actually, <laughs> yes. No. So submit your yeah. honeybee and alpaca questions to Brian. <laughs> <Livers>. <laughs> yep. So California, number two, South Dakota, number mm. three, Florida, number four, and number five was Montana. I almost oh, said okay. Florida. Yeah. Hmm. I would have guessed California and Florida. Because of the fruits and vegetables, yep, right? Mm-hmm. But I never would have guessed the other three. Any, yeah. any thoughts why those other three? North Dakota, Montana, South Dakota. Mm. I, I, a lot of I, natural I don't know. rangeland. Well, it's I pasture, yep. yeah. Because there's not as many people. It's not as busy, and there's less pesticides. Oh, and so oh. they, uh, yeah. So a lot of the habitats. I was reading a little more about honeybees, and a lot of the habitats similar between cattle and honeybees, like the mm-hmm. grasslands yep. and mm-hmm. open areas and. Diverse grasslands, not monocultures. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That makes yeah. a difference too, right? Because mm-hmm. you've got all the other things in there. The, yeah, all the, the forbs and stuff yeah. like that in there, yeah. So I don't know. I thought that was a little interesting thinking back to, I mean, kind of relate, trying to stretch to relate to cattle somehow, but uh, a lot of pastures, I guess. And Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks, Dustin. Appreciate you sharing those. Once again, that was Kansas State University's Beef Cattle Institute's Brad White, Dustin Pendle, Bob Larson, Philip Lancaster, and Brian Lubers. If you'd like to listen to this full Cattle Chat podcast, there are a few different ways to do so. You can go to their website, ksubci.org. Again, that is ksubci.org. Or you can also find it linked in today's show notes on actoday.net. Or you can also find it on the podcast streaming platform of your choice. And just a reminder that if you have questions or topics, you'd like discussed by the experts at the Beef Cattle Institute, you can send those in at bci at ksu.edu. Again, that is bci at ksu.edu. And on their website, there are plenty of resources available if you'd like to check out what they have to offer. They have tools available as well as resources for students, upcoming conferences, and articles on herd management, beef sustainability, and nutrition. They also have another podcast titled Bovine Science with BCI. You can also find it on their website or on the podcast stream platform of your choice. That's all we have for you today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you tomorrow. Tomorrow.